Sure, there have been a lot of Frankenstein movies, but never starring a bunch of hot guys. You're watching Beyond the Trailer's review of Victor Frankenstein. Igor, you and I shall be at the very heart of a scientific enterprise that will change the world. We shall create a life out of death. It's alive. Do you realize how significant this is? Oh, I have an inkling. I'm Detective Inspector Turpin. I'm here to investigate missing body parts. I'm not sure what you mean, sir. Are you not afraid to challenge the natural order? Mr. Frankenstein. No. And it's Frankenstein. <laughs> Daniel Radcliffe, James McAvoy, Andrew Scott. Sure, they don't quite write an army of cumberbitches, but each does have a small legion of adoring fans. Interestingly, though, even Benedict Cumberbatch struggles at the box office, and so has female co-star Jessica Brown Finley post Downton Abbey. Therefore, this movie cannot rely on star power, nor can it rely on the source material, as the most famous Frankenstein movies to this day remain, despite countless movies having been made, the 1931 original and 1974's Young Frankenstein, and neither are particularly loyal to that source material. So it would seem the lightning that will hopefully bring life to this movie is Max Landis, the son of infamous director John Landis who made his own splash with Chronicle, where he successfully broke down the superhero genre. After that he tried to reinvent the spy genre with American Ultra, Jason Bourne by way of Pineapple Express. But that failed, tarnishing Landis's rep much to his dismay. He took to Twitter, ranting that original ideas in Hollywood were dead. Although, again, Jason Bourne meets Pineapple Express, right? And Victor Frankenstein isn't an original idea either, but it is an original approach. Here, Landis tells the story from Igor's perspective, who's been reimagined, well, to be a role that interests Daniel Radcliffe. But despite Landis's hopefully inventive reworking and a very solid cast, these elements, along with a budget of 90 million, have been placed in the hands of director Paul McGeegan, who might have directed some episodes of BBC's Sherlock, but also the movies Wicker Park, Lucky Number Slevin, and Push. So, has Hollywood doomed itself to failure once more with yet another stupid business decision? Or is Max Landis a one-hit wonder? Or maybe, just maybe, this mad experiment is alive! So to this movie's credit, for the first time they've presented Frankenstein's creatures in a way that is probably pretty true to what Mary Shelley intended, and that's that they just look absolutely disgusting. You, see, you can see a picture here of the test chimp that they assemble during the movie, and as you can see, it looks like not just an affront to science, but to humanity. And you look at it, and you're like, why would anyone make that? And I have to say, I feel the exact same way about this movie. Now, that's not to say that Victor Frankenstein doesn't have good intentions, and it doesn't have a couple of good body parts. But overall, it's a horrifying mess that never should have been made. So first I'm going to talk about what I think is salvageable about the movie, and then I'm going to talk about where it just gets absolutely terrifying. Uh, I think like the worst thing I can say about it actually is that I got kind of bored during the movie because you know how Victor Frankenstein the story ends basically so you're just kind of like all right let's get to the monster already come on come on my mind started to totally wonder like should I get dinner after this and what are my plans for Thanksgiving again that's what this movie was like but as I said it has a couple of good parts so the first thing is that I think that Max Landis, while you're going to see script also underneath the bad category, I think that his, uh, his original idea was not bad, and I could totally see where he was coming from. Obviously, Max Landis is a fan of the comic books, as are many of us, and you can totally see that in his work, uh, in Chronicle, American Ultra, and here. This reminded me so much of so many Victorian-era comic books, uh, not that were written in Victorian times, but you know, comic books that tell stories from that era. Now, obviously, the master is a uh, League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, and this uh, shouldn't even be allowed to look at the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. It's so inferior. But when the movie started with its circus setting, I had, I had high hopes, because I was like, oh, I see what you're doing. This is like one of those alternate indie Victorian comics that, you know, you put it toward the bottom of your stack, and then it's a pleasant surprise, and you're like, oh, wow, that was actually really good. That's what I thought this was going to be, but it ended up being one of those comics where you're like, I'm never buying this again, and I'm sorry I spent $3 on it in the first place. 
Now, the next thing that I thought was pretty good was James McAvoy. And these are my notes if you're wondering what I'm looking at. Uh, James McAvoy, he overacted the hell out of this. I mean, Johnny Depp and Robert Downey Jr. would be proud. Uh, and it's a little bit of a shame. You know, you can see why they hired this director because this is kind of kind of ripping off or trying to rip off because it doesn't succeed uh, the BBC Sherlock show uh, and I think that James McAvoy makes a wonderful basic basically he was playing uh, Sherlock Holmes and he did a great job uh, he chewed the scenery he wasn't ashamed he wasn't embarrassed and I think it worked for him because you know it's like if you're embarrassed then the audience will be embarrassed for you and so James McAvoy so owned this performance that you're like I like what you're doing James even though everything else around you is crud so that was good also, the production design was also impressive. I thought that they realized Merry Old England, and it was like a stylized version of it because it was trying to very much show a world that was in flux, where new inventions were being discovered that were changing people's lives. And I thought that argument was used to good effect in the movie in some places, so that was good. Uh, but then also, I, the final thing that I thought was good was the monster, uh, Frankenstein's monster. But it was unfortunate because that didn't show up till the very end of the movie. I don't think they got to utilize it enough because it looks so good. I mean, if I were a producer on this film and they were like, here's our monster, I'd be like, wow, that looks great. We need to rewrite some and add some scenes with him because I spent all this money on him and I don't want to not use him. So that that was cool. I liked that a bit. It was actually my fate. You know, while these things were disgusting and seemed totally wrong against like uh, acts against nature, crimes against nature, that's what Frankenstein is supposed to be. So I think this is actually the best monster or monsters that I've ever seen in a Frankenstein movie. It's just too bad that the movie is so bad itself. So what didn't I like? Uh, well, I think the script, even though Max Landis was well-intentioned and I could see where he was coming from, the thing was just a mess. It fell apart. All the character intentions were bad. It was very surfacy. It didn't go deep enough with anyone. It tried to, but it was really like, I can't believe this is like someone who's supposed to be an experienced screenwriter. This reeked of like screenwriter, like, a fir like someone's first screenplay or their first movie screenplay at least. It was a mess. Although I think to Max Landis's defense, this movie was heavily edited in post because when I was uh, going over the open for this, uh, after having seen the film, there were some shots in the trailer that didn't make it into the movie, particularly that lab from the very first uh, bit of the trailer. So I was like, hmm, you cut out like the connective tissue of this movie, I guess, because it's not alive. Uh, then next, I have to say, I'm sorry to say, Daniel Radcliffe, I did not enjoy his performance here. And I finally figured out what's going on with Daniel Radcliffe. While I was watching this movie, I was like, you're the new Elijah Wood. And Elijah Wood, of course, became very famous off of Lord of the Rings. Uh, now, he was not playing, like, you know, nobody ever thought <laughs> that Elijah Wood was a heartthrob out of Lord of the Rings. But Daniel Radcliffe got somewhat of heartthrob status through Harry Potter. But he's totally acting like an Elijah Wood. And I think that both of them, you know, have one problem. They're kind of like man boys. And it's very hard to become an adult actor because of that. Elijah Wood has had trouble transfer, uh, you know, making the transfer. And even Michael J. Fox had a difficult time transitioning into being an adult star. And I think to some extent, none of them ever did. And I don't know if Daniel Radcliffe will. I think it doesn't help that he, like Elijah Wood, keeps choosing these, like, trendy, like, cult fan roles that really have no commercial viability. He is in Now You See Me Too, though. Finally, that might be something that's good for him. Or he'll drag the whole thing down. But anyway, the next thing that I sadly didn't like was Andrew Scott. Now, when the movie started, I thought Andrew Scott was excellent. He was a little bit like Sherlock Holmes. He was a very clever detective, and it was so refreshing to have the detective chasing our heroes. Uh, although, the way this movie presents them, I think whether or not the movie views Victor Frankenstein and Igor's heroes is debatable. But to have the person chasing the protagonists, I guess you could say, to have them be smart instead of bumbling was really nice. I really liked that quite a bit. So I was really disappointed when he just became like your religious zealot, you know, stereotype. And it, the character didn't need to be, because as I said, you take one look at what Frankenstein is building, and anyone would be like, this is a mistake, this is wrong, you need to stop right now. He didn't need that extra religious, um, you know, push to get him to be motivated. It was not necessary, it made the character just too, too ridiculous to root for. Uh, not to say, of course, that people believing in it, uh, you know, religion is ridiculous, but the way it was presented here was like, you know, that the dangerous zealot argument that's always done. If, it had been, if he had been presented as like constructively into religion, that would have been great. Maybe it would have worked, but this didn't. Then also Freddie Fox, this UK actor uh, who plays Finnegan, their benefactor, 
he was horrible. I mean, maybe he's good in other work if anyone else out there is a Freddie Fox fan, but he was just like a high school play. I mean, I know he was supposed to be like the same age as James McAvoy and Daniel Radcliffe, but he's definitely not the same age, I don't think, of James McAvoy. I don't know, he just looked much younger than both of them, and it was like really, really horrible. I think he did not do this movie any favors. And I have to say, ultimately, it's the director's job to pull this all together. So I think that it's his fault that this movie is so horrible, because not only is it the director's job to pull it all together, but I think this movie, at the end of the day, fits perfectly in line with Wicker Park, Lucky Number Slevin, and Push. And I, I don't think that's what Fox wanted when they gave him $90 million. So if you're, the only reason I can see anyone seeing this movie, quite frankly, is if you're a James McAvoy or Daniel Radcliffe fan. So I know that I can't keep you away from it, but I can tell you to rent it and wait and then just get ready to feel really bad for them. But not James McAvoy, because he owns it. He owns the horror of the movie. So I just hope he finds a project that's worthy of his enthusiasm, uh, beyond the X-Men films, of course. All right, so that's my review of Victor Frankenstein. I hope that I saved a couple of you this holiday weekend. Uh, and if you have seen Victor Frankenstein, be sure to leave your thoughts about it down below. Thank you so much for uh, tuning in, and you can check out some other episodes right now. Thank you.